Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our series, Mapping the Fraud Blueprint of Tomorrow, brought to you by BDO Australia. My name is Adam Sims, and I'm a Forensic Services Partner at BDO. Recently, the AS8001, so the Australian Standard 8001, was updated to provide up-to-date guidance on corporate governance relating to fraud and corruption. This webinar series aims to build your understanding and application of the standards through the three T's, tech, transparency, and tone from the top. And we'll be presenting these in a three-part series starting with today's session. Today, we are looking into tech. Focus will be about the tech strategy as opposed to the tech stack, although we might touch on the tech stack at some point. Um, before we kick things off, I'd just like to quickly draw your attention to some housekeeping. To start, you're all automatically muted, but we will be accepting questions throughout the session, and you could submit these using the question tab. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. However, if we cannot respond to your question, we will follow up with you after the, after the webinar concludes. If at any time you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please hit the support button. I understand that's at the bottom, one of the bottom tabs on your screen. And finally, this session is being recorded and all registrants will receive a follow-up email containing a link to the recording, access to register for future sessions and speaker contact details. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel of experts. I'm joined by Sophie Dawson, partner Bird & Bird, Sophie specialises in media and technology advice and disputes, including data protection and publication laws. Sophie, for anyone that knows her, really knows her stuff in this space. So welcome, Sophie. Great to have you here. I'm also joined by, you. sorry, welcome. <laughs> I'm also joined by Faisal Janif, Head of Cybersecurity at Marsh. Faisal is a Senior Security Executive and founder of the Cyber12. He sits on a number of initiatives such as the Australian Information Security Association's Executive Advisory Board and on the Australian Cyber Security Centre panel reviewing the Australian Cyber Security Strategy. There's a lot of cyber security in there. That experience speaks for itself, so welcome Faisal. Thanks Adam. We also welcome Roman Quadlovic. Roman is a partner at Simplicity One. He is a National Security Advisor and the former Australian Border Force Commissioner. Roman's career has been an inspiration to many, including myself, and he's a trusted advisor to government and now the private sector. Welcome, Roman. Thanks, Adam. Lastly, I'm also joined by my always relaxed and very able colleague, Ross Widows, partner cybersecurity BDO. Ross leads the cybersecurity practice in Sydney, which provides cybersecurity, data governance, technology risk, and GRC services. And as I always say about Ross, with his approach, I definitely want him on my team when it hits the fan. So AS8001 is, as I said, the fraud and corruption standard. But you're probably asking yourself, how does it relate to tech? Well, the standard is about preparing organisations to manage a risk of fraud. The contemplation of the recently updated standard necessarily focuses on advice to organisations in dealing with cyber-related crime, not surprisingly which is timely given the unprecedented surge in this crime type. Not only is it prevalent, but it's becoming a very complex and a, and a misunderstood area to manage from a risk perspective. And let's face it, really bad things can happen from tiny vulnerabilities in this space, which is what makes it so vital to understand. Um, it's, it's an important note that the messaging in the new standard, and, and I can't emphasise this enough, is pretty clear. And, and I might say too, with the regulators and legislators more broadly, so here and overseas, it is incumbent on board and C-suite to understand the threat landscape better in this area, to understand what their strategy is, and to understand what their own limitations are before deciding on the appropriate response. When it comes to cyber related crime, it is also important to have an understanding on what is happening outside the business, both nationally and internationally. As I said earlier, it's a complex area. However, like most things, it all starts with a thorough plan or a system, which is what an organisation should have in place. And this is what the standard talks about and where we'll start our discussion. Ross, um, given the standard is intended to apply to all organisations operating in Australia, from government to, to for-profit and to non-for-profit, what is the requirement in an information security management system which is mandated by the standard? 
Um, and, and if I could just ask you to consider, is, do you think it's disproportionate, a disproportionate request for all organisations or something that is scalable to needs? Yeah, thanks, Adam, and, and good morning, everyone. Nice to speak to you all today. So I, I might just step back. So an information security management system is, is simply just a, a way to govern and, govern and control um, risk in an organisation. It's not a technical system or a technical solution or anything like that. It allows you to think about risk in the context of your organization, the, the leadership, how you manage performance and, and the right controls that you need to have in place. In this situation, the, the fraud standard has asked for an information security management system that's aligned to um, cyber security or information security. And, and when we think about an ISMS, there are lots of different standards out there, especially from a cyber security perspective. There's, there's best practice, there are regulatory standards and, and governance standards. But typically uh, in the profession, we think of an ISMS being aligned to one standard in particular, and that's ISO 27001. And that's what the fraud standard has asked for here. And within ISO 27001, there are, there are two key components. There's a mandatory section and uh, let's call it an, an optional section. And within that mandatory section, it talks around, you know, what's the scope of our, of our environment? What are the sorts of threats that we face? What, what are the risks? Who's our leadership? How do we, how do we evaluate our controls? And, and, and all that good governance and management. There's a second section then, which is all around the actual control that you would have in place. So things like access management, change management, and things like that. Now, the fraud regulation has said, actually, we'll just consider the management side. So how do you actually manage and govern the, the ISMS without worrying about the implementation of controls, which I think is a good way to start. But I think going forward, I think, and, and Adam, to answer your question, I, I think it's a good idea for all organizations to think about it like that, because if you don't have a handle on what your risk is or what your controls is or, and, and what you're trying to protect and who you're trying to protect it from, it's really difficult to measure and baseline yourself. And we're seeing lots of requests recently from regulators. Um, so APRA have released their first information security standard, CPS 234. In New South Wales, we have the cybersecurity policy. Uh, which mandates an ISMS. We've seen the critical uh, Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, which we'll talk further about later, that mandates that organizations need to do, do some of the fundamentals. And we've seen the ASIC and the RBA and others have had a, an opinion on cyber or, or information security. So I think having that ISMS is a really good starting point and it enables you to understand what your actual risk is and what you need to do to manage it. The second component of that then is thinking about the controls that you need to have in place. Um, and how they're, how they're designed and how, how you test their effectiveness. I'll pass back to you now, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Ross. Uh, it's pretty clear that the, the regulatory frontline is, is moving forward. Um, I guess it begs the question, I mean, we, you know, what is the cyber risk landscape really looking like? I mean, there's no doubt we're seeing an uptick in, in cyber related crime on the news um, and, and perhaps some of us in practice out there, but, but how bad is it actually? Well, so I think, I mean, it's difficult. It depends on the organization and, and, and the, the, the threats they face. I think everyone has got different threat landscapes and everyone has different, different risks that they need to manage. I think if you don't have the right controls in place and you're not monitoring those controls, it, it can be really, you know, quite bad. But I also think in some situations, it's probably not as bad as people think if they've got the right things in place. When I, when I speak to any clients now, new clients particularly, the questions I like to ask them is, you know, do you actually know what you're trying to protect? Who are you trying to protect it from? Where is it? Who has access to it and why? And what controls do you have in place and how effective are those controls? And if, if you don't know the answer to any of those questions or you don't know the answer to all of them, it's actually hard to kind of start from a baseline and understand what the threat is and how you're trying to protect it. So I think that's the key first thing for me, understanding what we're trying to protect. The, a bank, for example, has a very different threat profile to, you know, a local government agency, local government agency, very different to a charity. So I think you need to baseline what you're trying to, what you're trying to protect and the controls, and then understand that broader picture. And then I think as well, you'll start to understand where you want to get to from a compliance perspective. You don't, not everybody has to be gold standard and you can make small changes over time that will help you. Um, I, I see a lot of organizations now and due to a lot of regulatory requirements, they're trying to fix things really quickly, which can be quite hard. It would be like somebody, I guess, 
trying to run a marathon tomorrow with no prior prior experience. I think you can do small things over time that gets you where you need to be. But that all said, we're still seeing an uptick in ransomware. Um, and, and that's changing as well now, you know, that we've heard the it's ransomware as a service. People are, are buying that service off organizations and ransomware was typically always an availability issue, but now organizations are seeing that their ransomware companies come back and say, well, we've actually compromised your data as well and we'll, we'll, we'll sell that if you don't actually pay the ransom again. So that it's an ever evolving uh, threat landscape and I think that's why organizations need to be kind of on the front foot and, and sharing information and, and talking to peers and talking to government agencies and others as well to make sure they're well, well prepared. Yeah, excellent. We should talk about collaboration a bit further. Roman, um, what are you seeing? Yeah, thank, thanks, Adam. Um, interestingly, I was having a conversation with a um, colleague or an ex-colleague who works at Interpol Cyber Centre in Singapore. And uh, Interpol has very recently calculated the uh, economic damage of cybercrime. So that's cumulative. It's uh, not just uh, ransomware that's paid or you know, loss of earnings or loss of revenue, but uh, downstream impacts. And its estimation currently is that it sits at $6 trillion US a year. So it gives us a sense of the magnitude or, or the scope of, of cybercrime and its impacts. But huge. In, in terms of um, in terms of who's responsible, you know, there are questions around, well, who are the threat actors? And, you know, a lot of effort is put into trying to demarcate between nation state actors and criminal gangs and hacktivists and, you know, your, your rogue uh, cyber hackers. But, um, you know, this is the great game, uh, attribution, as they call it in, in the cyber world, you know, who's responsible. This is the great game that cyber sleuths and CISOs and government cybercrime fighters play all the time. Attribution helps identify motive and in turn motive informs the response. So let me give you an example of that. If we can identify that there's a nation state behind a particular cyber attack, then the response to that is very different to uh, for example, a, a ransomware gang or a, a ransomware for service operator, as, as Ross just indicated, you know, the response to a nation state attack might be mounting some public condemnation with allies. Uh, there might be sanctions that are applied, uh, behind the scenes diplomatic efforts, et cetera. So attribution is very, very important in the context of uh, the response to cyber crime. Uh, how can that be achieved? Uh, well. You know, there are people on the panel, uh, let alone in the audience, I'm sure, that are uh, much more technically skilled than I am in this, but uh, at, you can at, tri attribute uh, through uh, identifying the vector, uh, the what they call TTPs, the, the tactics, techniques and practices that are used. But, you know, just like crime in the real world, those types of signatures aren't necessarily unique so it's not going to be that easy necessarily to identify who the, the threat actor is. Sometimes it's straightforward. Um, you might simply get a message from you know, a, a, an unidentified IP address, which is a high with the network again, and we've just locked up your data and uh, in order for it to be released, you need to pay us $10 million in Bitcoin. Um, but then you never know because uh, that could well be, as Ross said, um, a ransomware as a service where the Netwalker gang has outsourced that to uh, another set of operators who then pay Netwalker gang a commission on any ransom that they obtain. So attribution is difficult and it is even more difficult where there are sophisticated nation states involved. So just like in the real world where uh, nation states engage in the use of proxies, uh, you will all have seen this happen in geopolitics and history for many, many decades. Nation states, including our allies, will use proxy actors in the real world situations. They'll use militias, they'll use political movements, they'll use commercial operations to achieve their nation state objectives. And that happens in the cyberspace as well. It's quite common for those aggressive nation states to use cyber criminals as their proxies to steal or manipulate data. 
for example, uh, for espionage or interfering in a democratic uh, election process. But that data, that same data may well be, uh, have a dual purpose. It may be useful to the nation state, but it may also be useful to the criminal gang for profitable purposes. Uh, or, you know, the, the, it's quite conceivable that the nation state uses a proxy criminal gang to obtain data that serves the purposes of the nation state, but then uh, turns a blind eye or allows that criminal gang to operate with impunity for their own profit motives. So it's a very complicated space. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Roman. Uh, that's, that's frightening. Um, I do want to talk more about that line between state actors and, and organised crime soon. But before I do, Faisal, um, it seems to me this is an issue where organisations often need third party expertise. Um, 8001 also focuses on, interestingly, uh, third party or supply chain, um, what they call business associate risk. And I want to draw on that. Um, on a discussion you and I had about what you call the watches. Can you talk us through what you mean by that and, and what are the concerns with these watches? And I, I guess that's in the context that you, you can't outsource responsibility for information security. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks Adam. Um, so a lot of organisations have outsourced work to third parties, right? And depending on the type of industry you're in, it, you know, uh, you find um, organisations that help cater and help grow your business as a part of your corporate strategy, right? Even IT outsources work, right? Um, so a part of what they do is normally cyber would send out a third party questionnaire to assess the level of cyber maturity these organisations have. Um, you might include certain things in your contract um, if you're uh, you know, required by regulatory requirements to abide by a number of re uh, uh, regulatory requirements. And then that gets passed on to your third party providers to make sure that you're all compliant. But where I find the gaps are is what I call the watches, right? The watches for me are the people that I bring on board to help protect my organisation, right? So, you know, I could bring in an MSP provider or I could bring in someone for my firewalls. I could bring in someone for endpoints or a PAM solution or an IM solution, right? Um, you know, for my emails. Um, what we don't do, and I'm not seeing it being done a lot of, is do we assess these organisations, right? You know, what is your maturity level? How are you going to protect my organisation? Do we understand the data architecture in this space? Right, you know, what of my data is going into your organisation? What are you seeing? Where is it being held? You know, is 100% going overseas or is 100% onshore or is it 50-50? How is it? Right, what are you doing with that data? Right, where is it containerized? So if you have a breach, how are you going to protect me? Right. And that's one of the things that I, is, is a major gap. And if you look at the last 12 months, we're seeing a lot of vendor related breaches that are involved in helping organisations protect their environment and also detect in their environment, right? So we're running a number of agents in our environments, in our networks, right? That's um, providing alerts to someone somewhere, right? Now, if they get breached, and their data is compromised. And if their data is compromised, then the client's data is compromised. You know, are the threats able to move laterally and come from their environment into my environment? What exposures do I have in this space? Right? What are you going to do or what have you in place to protect me and my data? And this is where I think um, we do have a gap because we're good at assessing a whole bunch of vendors that provide services to us. But the cyber vendors, in my opinion, you know, we're not doing as much as we should in this space. Yeah, it's interesting. We've had a question um, about what contractual clauses and audit procedures, you know, would you consider essential, which, which goes to the heart of what you're talking about, I guess. Look, it depends on your organisation and, you know, what regulatory requirements your organisation has to adhere to, 
right? So if you're in the critical infrastructure space, you know, you really want to understand, you know, the amendments made to that bill, right, to the SOCI Act, right? And you want to understand what are your requirements. And one of the biggest requirements is data sovereignty, right? Where you have to keep your data onshore, right? Now, there is some arguments as to t the type of data that can go offshore if it doesn't contain, you know, any sensitive information, right? And that is a discussion that you'll have to have with your regulators and they might allow a bit of that, right? But overall, you want to really understand, you know, what your regulatory requirements are, right? And then you would have different um, agreements with each of the vendors, right? Not everyone will be looking at the same type of data, um, you know, whether you, you know, it's going into a cloud environment, whether you're sharing information. So a key thing to map out is your data architecture, right? And if you go into any given organization at the moment and you ask them, you know, and you pick a vendor, you know, and let's just say a cyber vendor, and you ask them what data is going to that vendor, right? how many of them will be able to answer that question? How many cyber teams or risk managers or, or IT even a CIO, right? How many of them will be able to answer that question? Right, and that's where it starts, right? So you've got to map out your data architecture, and it all goes back ultimately to what Ross said. Um, you know, when <clears throat> when he was speaking about understanding what you're trying to protect, right? You know, what are your crown jewels? What are you trying to protect? And that's one of the basics that a lot of organizations won't be able to answer, right? When you go back and ask them, well, okay, what are you trying to protect? And I call this appropriate level cyber, right? And it goes back again to what Ross had mentioned. You don't need the best tools in the, in, in the market, right? You got to understand what you're trying to protect and appropriately protect that, right? Because everyone has budgets to work to, um, you know, different types of businesses can um, have different risk tolerances, right? So what are you trying to protect and how are you trying to protect it, right? And one of the other important things is the alignment of the strategies, the corporate IT and cyber. They shouldn't be dysfunctional. They should all function as one. So there's a whole lot of things that sort of come into that play, right? And then, you know, it's all about how do you manage that risk ultimately. Mm. I think Adam, okay. if I may as well, I think um, mm. from a, just to add to that, from a third party due diligence perspective, broadly across all third parties, the third parties are so in interconnected now with organizations like Faisal said, and then there are other things that come on, that come into consideration like internet of things, connected devices and, and whatnot. So you've got a huge threat landscape. And if you do due diligence over that vendor, and we do due diligence over that vendor, vendors for clients it's a point in time assessment often conducted under an advisory you know lens so it's really difficult to say well you know we've done this assessment but over the course of the year things could change and, and that that could make you vulnerable i don't think anyone has really nailed the third party due diligence space yet and what we need to look for and and i think the question was as well around what sort of you know audit considerations should we think about well one thing that we found more recently is that organizations are asking us to do cyber or information security under um, an assurance opinion, so a capital A assurance, like you would do uh, for your financial audit, different subject matter. Um, but even then, that's, uh, that's, usually in, that's usually over a period, um, and you're not testing every control, you're testing a sample, so things could obviously go wrong in that period as well. So I think it's really hard to get yourself that you know, complete comfort, because these third parties become a really attractive target because they're often plugged into thousands and thousands of organizations. Yeah, diverse data. All right, um, so uh, it seems to be we're, we're expecting a lot from organizations and, and Roman, you touched on state actors. Um, how much responsibility should be placed on government given the control they have over infrastructure hubs, intelligence and the like? Roman, Sophie, can I get you to to comment on that? You know, what's the occupying in in what's occupying the thinking in Canberra at the moment? What's happening on the legislative front? Over to you first, Sophie. Thank you very much, Roman. Um, on the legislative front, I mean, and just tying together some of the things we've been hearing, I think there are consistent global trends. I'm 
I don't, like you, um, like BDO, Ben Bird's a global firm, and we're seeing around the world an uplift in the tax, an uplift in regulation, an uplift in localization requirements, because of course in Europe with Shrems 2, there's a big focus on um, data transfers and data transfer impact assessments, um, an increase in the need for mapping and an increase in the need for preparation, and also an increase around the world in regulation of data as critical infrastructure. If you look at the amendments to the national critical infrastructure legislation, it recognises that big data sets themselves can be critical infrastructure, which also picks up on what you're saying, what Basil was saying, what Ross is saying about the fact these huge data pools are key vulnerability points and it's necessary to really understand them. Um, so, uh, so for every organisation, it's so critical now to understand not only what your current regulatory requirements are, but where they're likely to go. And picking up on Faisal's point, it's really important to make sure that your contracts contain specific obligations which deal with your current regulatory um, requirements and your current threats, etc. But also some flex, just simple clauses like saying, you know, an obligation to cooperate with reasonable requests for assistance in dealing with new regulate, uh, regulatory requirements or new threats to ensure that the contract's got the flex to deal with this sort of um, continuing change that we're seeing from a regulatory perspective in this um, space. So we've got, because we've got changes to the national critical infrastructure um, legislation essentially to bring in a lot more sectors like broadcasting, um, and um, we've also got at the same time other changes like the Identity Matching Services Bill. We've got the Surveillance Legislation Amendment Identify and Disrupt Bill. Um, and we've got enhanced um, sort of uh, global cooperation legislation. So I think it's almost an unprecedented level of change in this space. But Roman, you've got um, probably a very good perspective part of the National Critical Infrastructure Bill. Um, changes is, of course, um, to allow essentially the minister to bring sectors within the ambit of that legislation. What do you foresee happening there? Thanks, Sophie. Um, yes, uh, great question. Um, yeah, interestingly, uh, there was a reference earlier to the uh, Security of Critical Infrastructure Act 2018. And I mark that date specifically because of its import to this discussion. So that act, the SOCI Act as it's known, was struck in 2018 as a result of the then Treasurer, now Prime Minister Scott Morrison, realising that there were foreign interests that were nefarious that were looking to buy up critical assets and infrastructure within Australia, particularly in the energy market electricity grids and the like. He wasn't satisfied at the time that there was sufficient national security filter over the top of those uh, foreign investments. There was certainly a foreign investment review process, uh, but he felt that there was an inadequate amount of national security input into those uh, proposed purchases. And so that was the genesis to the SOCI Act 2018. In those intervening three years, cyber attacks on critical infrastructure rose to such a level that by the time the SOCI Act was enshrined in 2018, the government was already drafting an amendment to that uh, Act in the form of the current bill that's before the Parliament to try and protect critical infrastructure not from foreign investors necessarily, although it's still important, uh, with, who have a nefarious purpose, but to protect it from cyber attacks and other foreign interference. And so what we have seen now is the introduction of a bill into Parliament. Uh, it's currently going through the parliamentary processes. Uh, it was anticipated to be enforced by the 1st of July this year. Uh, that didn't happen for a whole range of reasons. The parliamentary calendar was quite full. Um, what was initially looking like a bipartisan support for that bill uh, 
suddenly became not bipartisan because there was some uh, lobbying conducted by uh, unions and by uh, the large multinational tech firms who saw some risks to their operating models uh, through this piece of legislation. And so now it's been held up in a, uh, in a, in a parliamentary process where there, are, there is a degree of scrutiny over that. Having said that, um, those edges will be knocked off pretty quickly in my view. Um, I'll come back to one of those edges because it's important in terms of uh, private sector. But my, I anticipate that bill will find its way through and be enacted sometime uh, either towards the end of this parliamentary calendar, so the end of this calendar year, um, or in the first few sittings of next year, 2022. What that will mean uh, is that there will be a number of entities in the what's called what's described as the critical infrastructure industry more broadly. It's with 11 different sectors, and as Sophie mentioned, much much broader than what I initially described as what people ordinarily would think is critical infrastructure in terms of water, utilities, electricity. It now goes across uh, data management, it goes across broadcasting, it goes across telecommunications, food and grocery, space, defence. So there, are, there are 11 sectors that are captured. The initial uh, estimation by the government was that it would capture about 1,500 entities in, across the private sector space more broadly, all of which will have certain obligations to meet under this new legislation. There is a supplementary bit of legislation which is also wending its way through, which is the Ransomware Act, where there's a compulsion upon uh, entities to report whether they've paid a ransomware to a particular cyber gang. That's, that's going through a process as well. So those two uh, will work in conjunction with each other. But the, the amendments of the Critical Infrastructure Act, and I'll summarise these very quickly, Adam, uh, I'm sure there'll be more interest in it later on. We can discuss the detail. But what it will require is entities to have, demonstrate what they call a positive security obligation, legal term, PSO. Uh, that means that they will need to demonstrate that they have a resilience to a number of threats across four pillars, physical security, supply chain security, personnel security, and cyber security. Now, whilst there are four pillars to that, uh, to that new bill, Cyber is front and centre. In fact, cyber was the actual motivating or the, the catalyst to this bill coming before the parliament. And the first cab off the rank, so to speak, for uh, private sector entities uh, to meet under this PSO will be to demonstrate that they had a cyber resilience program in place. There are some, some real concerns, and I'll, find, I'll finish on this point. I'll, I'll bring the, 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 the point I put into, into Park a moment ago back into play. Um, there is going to be a requirement where if there is an attack on a private sector entity, a cyber attack, that is of a critical nature, and that's defined uh, under, under law, uh, there will be a compulsion, a, a legislative compulsion upon entities to report that to the federal government within 12 hours of becoming aware of that attack. There's then a lesser grade of attack. Um, a relevant attack, I think they call it, uh, the reporting requirement for that's 72 hours. But herein lies some of the uh, concerns with the bill at the moment. There is a provision that currently sits in there which allows the federal government to, my words, step in and uh, help a private sector entity deal with a cyber attack. And that may sound grand uh, uh, initially, but what is really disturbing some of the, uh, the larger companies, particularly the larger multinationals I mentioned before, is that whilst the federal government may well bring in some tools and some intelligence to deal with a cyber attack, uh, they may not have a equal priority on the commercial interests of the private sector entity that, they, that they're helping or assisting. And whatever they do, in the context of countering the cyber attack may well have a commercial impact. So that's working its way through the parliament at the moment. I, I expect that it's in, it just knocked off that before it gets into law. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Roman. Thanks, Sophie. That's very comprehensive. Um, Sophie, the, the law seems to be doing a reasonable job keeping up. Uh, do you agree with that or could it be doing more? <laughs> 
Well, I think it's interesting. I think that Roman has highlighted that there are trade-offs in every legislative decision. Um, so obviously part of what's now being done is to try and make sure that this bill, if passed, will be appropriate, for example, in the broadening broadcasting sector, because part of the role of the media is to hold government to account. There are always concerns about government accessing media data, and no doubt people are thinking about how best to manage them. Um, I think there's always a bit of um, a feeling that the law follows, to some extent, the practical consequences of the last round of reform. Um, so I, I think with the yeah, with cyber and with the internet, um, we're seeing now adjustments which reflect really the outcomes from the original sort of settings in these areas. Um, I think that um, it's always a careful balance that needs to be struck. And I think what's great is all of this legislation has built into it review processes. And I think it's going to be very important for those review processes to be fully utilised. Um, I'm always mindful in that regard of um, years ago looking at the Privacy Act and it doesn't apply in an easy way to cloud um, computing services. So it's a bit of guidance that's used as essentially a, a fix for a bit of a legislative gap. And I looked back and saw that the reason that that had happened is nobody had put in submissions about that particular issue in the law reform process. So I think active participation by industry in these changes and in these reviews is going to be critical to make sure that we get the right setting so that we're ensuring private sector as well as public sector um, entities have the right support to respond appropriately to attacks. And also that we're keeping other fundamental underpinnings of our democracy and economic system firmly intact. Thanks, Sophie. Your internet's breaking up a little bit, but we can still hear you clear enough. Um, okay, in, in terms of industry, uh, and I, I just want to touch on this very quickly because I want to move to the next point, but can I open it up to all of you? Is there room for information and intelligence sharing across industry? So we've spoken about government. And, and we've touched on what the law's doing, but what about industry? Is there enough collaboration happening amongst competitors, amongst sector participants, sharing information about cyber? I know My a lot of in the, sorry, go. sorry guys, <clears throat> in the energy sector, um, there is a fair bit of collaboration in that space. Um, yeah, the CISOs or the heads of cyber within the energy sector, um, they do get together quite a fair bit on regular calls to discuss issues. And, um, you know, even in, in the finance sector as well, um, I know, you know, there, there's there's groups that get together. So um, the, I think there is a certain level of collaboration um, currently happening, but is it to an extent where, you know, it needs to be, um, depending on the type of industry, you know, obviously I think there's obviously a fair bit of room for to mature in this space. Okay, thank you. Um, um, just, to, I, I think there's a there's a comparable example, which uh, I think the answer to the question is yes. By the way, but um, if you look at the uh, the phenomenon of of money laundering for a moment, uh, you know that's a significant issue um, that affects financial industry uh, across the whole. And you know you could argue that the financial industry is highly competitive. Uh, you know commercial information is jealously guarded um, to maintain advantage. And yet there is a an example of a, a collaboration or an information sharing as you, as you describe uh, that's hosted by Austrac, our financial uh, crimes regulator. Uh, it runs a an intelligence hub, if you will. Um, and in essence, that is, this is a, the Fintel Alliance. Yeah, the Fintel Alliance, yeah. and a you know, yeah. great example of uh, sharing yeah. whilst maintaining commercial um, uh, confidentiality. Is the, the it's a physical location. Uh, each to the financial institutions that participate in that, from the you know num number of the big four to second and third tier institutions, put their systems and their people and their intelligence together. Uh, they share what they need to in terms of threats and solutions and trends, uh, anomalies, uh, and they're able to achieve great things combating money laundering whilst preserving and protecting their own commercial imperative. So, 
I, I do think that there are uh, existing examples where that can occur. Sorry, Roman, we missed that last bit. Might have a bit of a technology yeah, blackout. Got I've got you now, loud and clear. Hello? Maybe not. You got me back, where did I, where did I drop off? Just that last last two points you were yeah. making. Got some issues to my microphone. Uh, have you got me now, Adam? Yes. No. No, let me let me try and speak. Have you got me now, Adam? Yes, got you clear. Yep. No? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, thank you. The point I was making was that um that FinTel Alliance allows the financial institutions to come together with their intelligence to share that. Uh, to identify trends and anomalies, but at the same time protect their commercial imperatives. So I think there is a good example there of uh, where information can be shared across industry whilst protecting their commercial interests. That's a great analogy. All right, so um, at a strategic level, there's, there's a whole heap of things happening. Um, I'd like us now to shift gears and go to the tactical. Let's say a cyber attack happens Let's keep it generic. What do organisations do? I'll open it to the panel to respond. We're in trouble. I think Sophie. Ross, talking. Ross do you want to start? Oh, I thought, sorry, I thought Sophie was talking, but she was, she was on mute. Yeah, I can start. Um, so I think, look, from 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 our side, we typically, my team typically get engaged either either before to help with the preparation or after the event to understand what's happened. Um, I think for the, the preparation side, as we've talked about, there's a piece that comes down to understanding your data and your architecture and, and, and the controls and things like that. But, but from a prep, it's all around, the, you know, what are the basics do you do? Do you educate your staff? Do you do have the right configuration and hardening? What password management do you have? Do you have multi-factor authentication? Do you do user access well? That's an area that's difficult for everyone, especially privileged access. You know, do you patch and do you have response plans and do you test them? I think that's a big area I often see is where people have response plans, but they actually don't test them. And if they do test them, do they involve the right people um, or do they just, you know, execute at the really technical level? Because I think when, when, a, when an incident does happen, depending on the severity of it, there are a lot of people you need in the room at that point. You know, you need your technical people. You're going to need senior management in there as well. You probably need legal representation. You get, you, you're going to need help from your vendors as well. So I think in that uh, test plan phase, it, it's really important to involve the right people. I think from so a it's like a, a classic crisis management approach to an issue in the business. Yeah, hundred percent. And 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 I think for the board as well, there's a there's a piece in that prep. It's important to get them to understand what it actually means for them in reality, because I think a lot of um, professionals and cybersecurity teams may go to the board and they may present on how many vulnerabilities they had in a month or how many unpatched systems there are and things like that which is all useful data but i think you need to tell the story in a way that the board can understand i think we all like a story as humans good or bad so i think you need to bring the, the kind of board on the journey with you and one thing we do uh, here and other organizations do as well is, is do that simulation and pitch it at a, at a board level so they can understand what's happening from start to finish and part of the board can be the attackers and part can be the defenders. And they don't have to get really into the technical detail, but they can understand what things you can do, how you would, you know, enter an organization as an attacker and the defensive options that you might you, you, you might be able to deploy. So I think getting the board on that journey is, is, is really important. Um, from that post analysis piece, we obviously then, we can help management understand, you know, was there anything they could have done beforehand or was it, was it something that just got through and they, and they didn't capture it? or it could have been through a third party as, as Faisal mentioned. And then it's all around, did they do the right thing through that analysis, containment, eradication and recovery phase? Are they following the, the right steps? And, and, and really helping them build the timeline out of what happened. And so that can be presented, presented back to, to management. There's Just to a, add on to what um, yeah. <clears throat> Ross was saying, Ed, you also you know really want to understand the next level down from your whole um, crisis management team, right? So the whole recovery process, the underlying. So that's where your technology teams work with on large, if, if you're a quite a large organisation, then 
you know, you're running an MSP or an MSSP, um, you know, that runs a SOC for you or helps you in the recovery process. You'd also want to understand how that all fits in, right? Because there's a communication channel that needs to be set up, right? You know, you know the crisis management or the executive leadership team, they'll be making strategic decisions. Right, they'll be making decisions like, as Ross pointed out, you know, uh, do we report this under the notifiable data breach scheme or, or don't we? Right, you know, what type of data has been, um, you know, compromised? Right, is it PII data, PHI data? Right, um, you know, then that information gets relayed sort of up and down into the whole of recovery. You know, comms that need to go out. Right, you know, what do we tell our customers? What do we tell our clients? Also, the whole of forensics that, that are working, that are passing information on. So there needs to be your incident response plan, <clears throat> you know, is a layered document, right? You need to understand, you know, from a strategic crisis management team level, you know, the titles that are going to be involved, right? These are the people that are going to make the decisions based on the information that's been fed up to them from, you know, the business recovery teams. So I think that's a very important part in the whole of managing an incident that the whole communication part is also, you know, talked about, tested and really stress tested into what's coming out, what's going out and the type of comms that are going out because there are a few loopholes, um, you know, my words, um, you know, whether <laughs> if you look at uh, corporate data compared to PII data, the PHI data doesn't need to be reported. That's something, you know, the legal teams would discuss at the executive level to see, you know, look, you know, this is what's been breached. It's corporate data. Do we need to report it, etc. Also, if you take a ransomware <coughs> situation, you might have a company that has been exposed to a ransomware, but, you know, they've decided to pay it. Therefore, technically, no data has been breached, right? Yeah, that's a technicality, right? But is that true? The forensic teams will be able to come in and do all that analysis and then provide that information up to, to understand, you know, where it needs to be, right? So we really need to understand that communication level and make sure there's a lot of clarity around what needs to be reported is reported. Just from a legal perspective, Basil, just making a few observations. I guess the first one is, practically speaking, I agree with everyone that you need to have a team identified in advance and you need, in a practical level, their mobile phone numbers. I think the people you need on that team include lawyers and depending on what industry you're in, it might actually be more than one type of lawyer. You certainly need someone like me, a sort of privacy and um, sec you know security law sort of lawyer. But um, you, you may also need to be considering, if you're a publicly listed company, what your disclosure obligations are to the stock exchange, depending on what's happened. You may also need to be considering, for example, I had one which involved shareholder data where we got the HIN number changed through our corporate team um, to avoid fraud. You might also need to be thinking about the terms of your insurance policies. You might also need to be thinking about other regulators. If you're in banking, for example, you will certainly need to be thinking about regulators other than the Privacy Commissioner. There are also other laws that come into play. For example, in New South Wales, it's an offence not to report a serious indictable offence. So um, you need to be aware of that because people can get caught up in the Privacy Act mandatory data breach notification, which is important. But they can miss the fact that they can be committing a crime with a penalty of up to two years imprisonment by not reporting it under a different piece of legislation of the Crimes Act. So people need to take a holistic approach. People need to think in advance about how it applies to them with their insurance policies, with their particular industry set of regulations. So you touched Faisal on health data. Health data is obviously the subject of a whole area of extra legislation over and above sort of the Privacy Act. Um, so it's, it's clever to map your data, to, to map your regulatory obligations, to think in advance about what expertise you need around the table. You need someone who understands your business deeply. So for example, I've had a matter where the major shareholder of a company, his um, whole bank account stuff was all released. And of course, that was, as a practical commercial matter, really important. 
um, and the CEO got on the phone to him and dealt with that. So there are some things where you need to be actually thinking as a business diplomatically, not just about the regulatory piece and not in a process driven way. Um, so you need um, the PR person, you need your internal IT, and I think best practice is to have an external IT um, consultant as well. That gives regulators some comfort. Um, and also it's stressful for your internal IT if something's gone horribly wrong. Um, and having a third party you can come to it a little bit more dispassionately and preferably you've had some knowledge of your systems, I think is incredibly helpful in those sorts of situations. I think that's a very valid point, mm -hmm. Sophie, to make sure that you have the right type of legal representation sitting at that strategic level because if you don't have the right type then you, you know obviously they'll give you advice based on as you say could be just what your regulatory obligations are and you make decisions on that which could potentially lead to further implications if you don't have the right type of legal people and I think that's a very very valid point and a good one. Do I perhaps look in that, that um, those contributions Adam? Sorry, Roman, I missed that. Could I uh, bookend those contributions? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I want to underscore the theme which has been uh, consistent across all the contributions of the panelists so far, and that is if the first time you're thinking about how to deal with an attack is at the point of response, can I suggest that you're going to be in some significant strife? Um, it is likely you're not going to be able to recover from a DDoS attack you're not going to be able to unlock ransomware and you're certainly not going to be able to assemble the right expertise together in enough time to actually deal with the attack. It's simply not going to happen. I like to look at it across the continuum. Uh, Ross mentioned before around some of the preparatory steps. Um, the way I look at it is there's a prevent prevention aspect and that's all about things like making sure you've got your patches in place, you're dealing with your cyber sociology, um, you know, how your staff and how your contractors behave in terms of user IDs, passwords, those types of things. Very, very important to prevent an attack in the first place. Then the second part of the continuum is your preparedness. And again, Ross made a really good point around, well, okay, in your preparation, what's our, what are our crown jewels? What are we trying to protect the best? How do we go about doing that? If we get an attack, this is the way we assemble a team. This is the way we respond to that. We simulate, we exercise. So that's the preparation part. The response almost comes as a uh, an automated uh, uh, consequence of doing those two other things. So the response is the response. It depends on the type of attack, the extent, the scope, your own protocols, your own data. You, yeah, it's very hard to prescribe a typical response because it's so variable depending on the on the circumstances. And then once the response is dealt with, at the end of the continuum, you've got your recovery. Because clearly you recover in terms of your data loss, uh, stakeholder re reputations, PR, etc. So that starts the continuum again where you get into your recovery mode. What lessons have we learned from that attack? And let's go back into preparation and response. Yeah, thank you, Roman. Um, certainly, the the investigation phase too is is probably something we could devote an hour to, and I just draw listeners' attention to the digital evidence first response within the new standard, and the guidelines around investigations uh, also. Okay, guys, um, some excellent advice there. Thank you. Um, I, I guess in in wrapping things up, we've gone over time a little bit, but in wrapping things up, it'd be remiss of me not to tap into the collected experience on the panel, and ask um, what's on the horizon in the in the cyber crime space. So you may have covered it off on some of this, but what what are the big ticket items boards, C suite, and and practitioners should be watching for? Ross, did you want to start? Yeah, I think I think for me, what, what I will say is when we're talking about um, all this different regulation and different things people should do and not do. There's a lot of organizations out there that haven't had to tackle that before. So if you're talking at the big end of town, the banks and whatnot, they're prepared for it. They they still have opportunities to improve, but they understand what that means. There's, there's a lot of organizations out there who actually aren't prepared and don't know what that means. And 
to Roman's point around demonstrating resilience in a number of areas. They've probably never had to do that before to the degree that a lot of these standards are asking for. So I think both uh, that's a challenge for both management and the board to be able to get their head around that. So I think, you know, definitely, um, I think when we talked about information sharing there, again, I think that's where it's key to talk to peers in industry and understand what others are doing and you know tap into organizations that can help with that as well because it can be it can be a challenge and you don't want to leave it until the last minute similar to what we said there about a ransomware attack you may not consider it until the you know it's actually happened i know with a lot of legislation people leave it until you know the night before it actually comes it kicks in and then they start worrying about it and then it's hard to get where you need to be so i think if you're uh, if you are one of those organizations you know re think about who you can reach out to for help in, in, in those areas yeah, it was a good point Roman made. Roman? Yeah, um, look, I, I think uh, to use another you know, cyber term, attack surface, the um, growth of the attack surface for entities is something that is uh, nothing short of phenomenal. Uh, it used to be you know, a server in someone's back room that was the attack surface. That was the point where the data was concentrated and you know that was the vulnerability and uh, you, know, you, you patched it and you put some security physical security around it and all was good but now we have a world where we have uh, six billion uh, websites uh, six billion um, users big, big pardon, six billion internet users in the world you have 27 billion uh, IoT devices, uh, you know, not just wearables, but uh, mobile devices that are all interconnected. So an individual who carries a phone and a laptop and wears a smartwatch, you know, there, there are three points of interconnectivity between that person and his or her professional entity through emails and uh, communication channels like Slack and everything else. And that creates a massive attack surface in terms of a private sector entity's vulnerabilities. It's not just the traditional server, it's their employees, it's the devices the employees use, not just the, 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 the um, company issued devices, but their personal devices. Everyone has you know, their emails on their smartwatches and uh, you know, their iPhones and their, their, their Mac and laptops, both personal and professional. And I think, you know, uh, when you think about those figures, which are just growing almost exponentially, you've got a massive attack service to deal with. Indeed. Faisal? I think one of the key things to understand is <clears throat> these criminals don't discriminate and they're at all levels. Right? You'll have some that are happy to change, you know, the, the banking account on an invoice to nation state act. Right. So one of the important things for me is understanding your environment, right? So the detection and protection that Roman mentioned earlier, right? You've got to be able to detect what's in your environment to protect it, right? And that's where we're seeing a lot of gaps. And, you know, things like ransomware where your data is encrypted or, you know, your data is exfiltrated, they don't happen at a click of a finger, right? You know, large amounts of data take time to encrypt or to uh, exfiltrate. So, you know, improve your detection capability, which in turn will help you understand how to prevent, right, once you know what's happening in your environment. If you don't know what's happening in your environment, you know, how are you going to protect your environment? Is one of the big key things that I think people should really understand. Yeah, great point. Um, Sophie, hopefully the internet holds up. So I think that there's a recognition now for boards around Australia that privacy is no longer sort of an optional low-grade issue to be pushed down in the organisation. It's top of mind. People recognise that as a key asset. They recognise that it's being much more regulated. The internet's becoming more regulated as well as governments become more sophisticated in their approach to these issues. So I think for companies, the bar is lifting and it's going to lift a lot more in the next six months in terms of what's going to be expected by boards of their um, organisations in terms of preparedness, structure, organisation um, and um, and really having the resources they need, not just in place, but as Roman mentioned, trained to, to respond in the way that they need to.
Mm. Great points. Okay, um, we've we've gone a bit over time, so um, it, we probably have uh, two minutes for questions. Has anyone got any questions in the audience that they'd like to send through and have the panel answer? Okay, I've got a question here. Um, what, what is the most important change that a business should make to protect itself against fraud, in particular cyber fraud? We've probably covered off on a number of those points, but anyone want to have a shot at that? I think one thing for me, I think when it, when you think about cyber fraud, I think is there's a lot of downstream controls, that aren't cyber controls that you need to consider. So if you're if someone's, if there's a business email compromise attack where money needs to leave the door and it's coming because um, there's an email that's spoofing your CFO, something technically has obviously happened there, but down the chain for that money to leave the organization. There are, there are other downstream controls that are more of your general controls, like who can release that amount of cash? What are the checks and balances in place? So I think that's where technology and, and, and some more your general controls need to work together um, because if one one fails, um, the other one should be able to, you know, add, add, add an extra layer. Yeah, I agree. Just and I think too, to that. Sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, just to add on to that, one of the important things is people, right? You know, we are the <clears throat> the weakest link. So, you know, some tailored staff training would, you know, and at a consistent level would would go a long way as well. Yeah, and that goes and to I'll think... uh, uh, bookend that again. Um, yeah, it's organisational culture towards cyber security. Too often there is a reliance on the cyber security. Um, function within a uh, an organization to deal with cybersecurity and it's not it's every employee's responsibility and therefore it's cultural change that that i think in my view is the most important and also um with fraud more generally um don't forget threats from within as well make sure that you're taking appropriate steps so, you know with your auditors and others to identify any issues and investigate things when they Okay, because it's important for people to know that your organisation's sort of alert and that when there is a reason for concern, it'll be investigated and dealt with. Yes, um, thank you for all that. Um, I think from my perspective, a, a, a proper robust risk assessment um, which encapsulates pretty much everything that you're all saying is, is something that is often overlooked. So, um, yeah, understand the risk environment, the threat environment through risk assessing and then uh, move to putting your program in place. And Roman, you, you stole my thunder there for the, the third session. We'll be running around time from the top. We'll be talking about culture. Um, that brings us to the end of this discussion. Thank you to Sophie, Faisal, Roman and Ross for your valued insights. Um, amazing panel, much appreciated. I'm sure the listeners uh, would agree that was a great session. Um, at some point, you'll see on your screen the details of our next two webinars. Next month, we'll be discussing transparency and delving into the construct that is modern truth, the human impact to whistleblowing, and what is required uh, to an organisation, what is required of an organisation to maintain transparency. Uh, that'll be a really inter interesting, introspective look at the human side of corporate crime. Following on from that webinar, we'll share the details. Uh, from this webinar, we'll share the details um, in in a follow up email to the session today. Finally, uh, before we close this session, uh, we'd appreciate it if you fill out a short feedback survey that will launch once we close the webinar to help us improve our future webinars. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you can join us in our next webinar. Remember, if you are in lockdown, phone a friend, get out for a walk, but more importantly, protect your mental health. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, guys.